Oh, the other thing to say is we might, we might have a tour come through here. There's a Chinese delegation visiting us today because we don't have enough to do, right? So, um, so just FYI, there might be a group of <laughs> Chinese guys walking through at some point, <laughs> briefly. Just so we can just say hi to them or whatever. Uh, ni hao. Uh, so, okay, so last time we talked about um, some of our, our sort of large picture context of eras of laws and, and um, uh, factors influencing coastal policy. We, we paused, we still have more to talk about, but we paused talking about the context of California fitting within the larger US and how, if you recall, we had that, that commission late 60s that sort of did a holistic view of our oceans and, and really spurred a bunch of policy uh, innovations and, and laws and such uh, in the early 70s. And then we ended up saying that we had a similar thing come along in the, in the late 90s, trying to do the same thing. We, and and that lead, that, that's in the, we're in the process of leading to hopefully some, some new policies and laws. One of the things we, we flagged, though, uh, was this whole aspect of California trying to deal better with protected areas in the ocean. So I want to put our policy discussion on pause for a second. Well, not for a second, for a while, for today. <laughs> And I want to start talking about our marine protected area network as a first uh, foray into this. Now, we haven't talked in depth about fisheries, which is a key part of this, but we'll, we'll touch on a few things here, and hopefully this will make sense. Okay? So let's take a look. Obviously, we have a lot of threats that you guys know about in terms of challenges to our coastal and marine environments, um, and we could, you know, and we have been talking about these things and we'll talk about these things for a long time. Um, one of the biggest large scale trends that you guys have been polling the public about and you guys are writing about right now in your, in your paper and, and all that good stuff is this notion of um, changing abundances. So this is a picture from the uh, late 1800s uh, showing uh, these guys are all sitting on abalone shells, right? So that Lots. This was a resource that was very, very abundant back in the day. Uh, now, so, so back in the day, you had to do, you had to go out with a hook, let's say, um, or or an iron and pop it yourself. And you basically, these guys went from the shore. A few people went in uh, on a boat, but generally, most people went from the shore. A big innovation was hard hat diving, where people could come in and actually. And I'll put a video up for you guys. Um, that's a great historical look. Uh, uh, a Huell Hauser? Are you kidding me? Abalone? What's that? Right? Um, great one that they filmed about a decade, decade, decade and a half ago in Monterey with one of the last living abalone farmers that used to farm it with a hard hat. So that was a huge innovation. But now we have a huge, um, it's very different, right? So now you don't have to be a specialist to, to get these guys or whatever. Pretty much anybody can get it. So here, here's some sea kayaks tricked out. Here, these guys have gone fishing, and they're, they have a spot for their beer. They have a, a, a you know spot for their radio. They have their satellite navigation, so they can find the site exactly. Um, so even without having a big factory trawler or something, I think we typically associate with sophisticated modern exploitation of resources. Um, clearly, clearly these things. Uh, the ability to extract resources from our coastal marine environment has changed dramatically over the last uh, many decades, century or so. Not only have the gross numbers of critters changed, but we're, but we're also seeing the, um, in terms of if we want to mention fisheries, let's say, the maximum size of these individuals has shrunk. Now, a fantastic project I would love for someone to do. I keep waiting for somebody to do this. For the last couple of years, nobody's been interested. Uh, now, people have done this in Florida and some other great places. We're, we're trying to do this in the Cook Islands. But um, a fantastic project, which is perfect for somebody who likes to hang out in bars. I'm not encouraging that, but I'm just saying. Um, and, and has a little bit of money to spend, um, would be uh, to go to places such as um, uh, Paradise Cove. Paradise Cove in Malibu has this great historical collection all on their walls. If you guys have ever been there, you've seen all these really cool pictures. 
Uh, and they're da- most of them are dated, 1952, 1930, 1970. And they show people catching fish in and around Malibu. A fantastic project is to go and take a picture of each of those guys, measure the size of the, that will identify the species, which is probably going to be pretty easy, but then measure the size of that fish and look at over time the change. So using a non-traditional data source to look at how perhaps the size of our fishing has changed. That doesn't measure the effort, but that, but that um, could be a gr- very interesting way to show that. And what people have done, when people have done this in Florida and elsewhere, we've seen that the average, and, and this is really uh, a particularly good data set because fishermen, that especially are doing fishing contests, Biggest fish wins, right? So they they're very peculiar about making sure we have a, a appropriate scale. You know, we're, we're measuring them objectively, this and that, and so uh, those can be really neat data sets. And what you see is, for example, this guy on the left with this black sea bass, or what we're getting now is called giant sea bass. Um, that was a regular catch. Check this thing out. It's bigger than that dude. Now the dude's a little shortish, kind of, but still um, huge, right? It's 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 a um, unusual event to see these guys now. When I was an undergrad, was that undergrad? No, when I was doing my PhD, it was the first time I actually saw one underwater at Catalina. This is after, uh, or this is ju- just in the wake of uh, a gillnet ban, which we'll talk about later. Um, and uh, essentially they were starting, to, they were beginning to come back. And this guy was a juvenile. This guy was probably the size, the one on the right, where that, the, the guy has his hand on in the surf. It was probably about that size. I almost messed my pants. And I, it looked like a VW bug. Like a VW bug without the emission problem. Like, like, like an old VW bug, right? I mean, it looked massive. It looked absolutely massive. These guys, absolutely fundamental predators on our reefs here. Incredibly important part of our subtitle ecosystems here in Southern California. Now, when we say predators, people think of tigers and they think of sharks, and you should. But this massive fish was a very, very important predator. Look at that mouth. That mouth is massive. Suck down whatever, suck down other fish, suck up some lobsters, whatever. So the fact that we, that we have these guys still in our system is it's great. They've survived because they essentially had a refuge in, in Mexico, basically, and that they've, they've been recolonizing our, so the Southern California bite here, and they're starting to get bigger. And, and so um, we're not out of the woods yet by any means, but we're on a great trajectory with regards to these, these species. But nevertheless, the size has changed. So even if nothing else, even if we had the same number of fish as we had back then, the ecosystem effect of a smaller bodied predator is different because the little guys can't eat the same things as the big guys. So clearly things have changed. And not only have, uh, have these charismatic things changed, um, other things have changed. One of the things we have the best data on are rockfish we have a huge diversity of rockfish. These are um, uh, fish that are generally deeper dwelling. And uh, this is just a, 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 a sum of our populations. And what you see is this, this, pop, this pattern that you've seen in the readings and elsewhere. We started off at some high level back in the day, right? The, the time scale will change depending on what species we're talking about. But we generally speaking start with a, a high bunch of um, uh, critters and we go to a uh, lower level. In this case, this is spawning biomass. This is, the, this is the amount of fish tissue, essentially, which is a way to compare a big, bigger fish versus a smaller fish. But the amount of fish tissue that is of, um, of sexually mature size, so that could contribute eggs or sperm to reproduction. Um, and so, so along with that story, as I just mentioned, of the changed number of fish, this, we've, we've seen this kind of stuff. So back in the day, here's, here's the champion, here's, here's the, the winning um, uh, landings of uh, these fish, right? In this case, this is an East Coast uh, picture. But it serves to make the point. Back in the day, big fish, a little bit sooner, uh, slightly smaller fish and a different species. Then as we get uh, forward to today, we see this kind of stuff. Okay, so this is the classic shifting baseline issue, which is if you were born, so okay, so this summer, 
uh, we took our my son's scout troop to summer camp. So we went to the summer camp. Supposedly, this is up in the Sierras, this particular camp. Supposedly, a great place to fish. So uh, when I was in the scouts, we'd go to the same summer camp year after year after year. Things are different now because I don't know why, but they're different. And so uh, we go to different summer camps. And so this summer camp, we knew we'd not been to. But what everybody heard was, it's a fantastic place to fish. Oh, my God. And one of the... One of our uh, scout masters is a great fisherman. He's like, oh, I'm out of fishing. I'm going to bring the poles, and they're going to get the fishing very bad, and it's going to be great, right? So we go to this lake that supposedly was lousy with fish, and uh, so se- thankfully everybody that was going after their fishing merit badge got their fishing merit badge. One of the requirements is, though, you have to catch a fish. The largest fish they caught was about seven inches long. And the kids that hadn't caught a fish, they were like, this is great. This is awesome. I got a fish, right? And that was cool for them. But it's nothing like what catching your first fish used to be, right? Now, that was in the lake, not the ocean, but the same principle applies. So, so if on the right, if you, if you went fishing with your mom or your dad and you went and you got some fish and they were legal, it's awesome. It's great. Check it out. Woo, got this. That would become your norm, right? That would become your, your uh, mindset, that this is the thing that um, is a big catch. And so what we expect to be a healthy system, what we expect to be a well-functioning community is always shifting. And as we degrade these systems, our expectation shifts. And so that hence, the, the shifting baseline term. This applies to all manner of ecological environmental challenges, but it was first articulated in this, in this, in this way for fisheries in the marine environment. Vanessa. So since our baseline has been shifting, has like the legal catch size, like policy-wise, have they moved Oh, good question. Way? Good question. So, so, so the critters might be getting smaller. Has our... Uh, framework for what you can harvest been shifting along with it generally generally no so uh for example let's say the guys on the right okay so 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 we we have a, a size limit for the guys on the left let's say even if they're becoming harder to fish we wouldn't have shrunk the the size they were allowed to take generally speaking what generally does happen, though, is things that we didn't think we needed to create a size limit for or didn't need to create a maximum number of fish you can catch in a day because they're so abundant, one, or two, they were so, nobody would target them, right? So they weren't really exploited very heavily, so we weren't worried about them. So what has happened, though, as, as, we've, as we shift the baselines, we, we introduce new species into the management framework, typically. Um, now this is this is a, a cartoon from these guys down at Scripps, and this is uh, a picture of a typical kelp bed today. What we would see if we threw on a mask and we went and jumped in the water. And then on the left, and maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do a snorkel out at uh, La Jolla when we go down on our trip. I don't know. Do it. Well, maybe. Okay. We'll. we'll We'll, 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 we'll do it, we'll do it, yeah, maybe. But anyway, um, so, so if, if, we did, if we did snorkel out, uh, let's say to the La Jolla beds or whatever, you'd see something like on the right, which is a typical uh, macrocystis dominated giant kelp bed here off our Southern California coast. And we'd see a, a good number of fish, generally speaking, a lot of fish, that's cool. But you, if you look there, mostly you're looking at, it looks like, looks to be chromis, I think, mostly. So these little blacksmiths and, and uh, some other fish, you know, they're, they're about fist size. They're maybe two fists sizes, that, that sort of size. You'll see a bigger fish, of course, here and there, but that's what you'd see. Versus what, what these guys have done with this cartoon here on the left is try to represent a more typical abundance back in the early 60s. Right. It, it's just a very different I mean, this, this, this is a cartoon, so you probably wouldn't have seen two male sheephead together like that, but that's another story. Um, so, 
So, so a lot more stuff, right? So it becomes very easy. We see this stuff on the right, and it's still cool. It's still totally awesome, right? It's still one of the neatest places on the planet, in my opinion, to go hang out. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't even cooler back in the day. So shifting baselines. Uh, as we talked about last time, one of the solutions that, that uh, conservationists have hit on in the last 20 years or so is this notion of, uh, yes, we have size limits. Yes, we have maximum number of fish that can be landed and this and that. And we have those tools. But we need a new tool. And one of the new tools that was promulgated is this notion of marine protected areas. So an area in space that's defined that limits the type of exploitation that can go on in that, uh, in that defined areas, in that defined area. And it's gotten a lot of press, it's gotten a lot of publicity, et cetera. This is not our data, but this is some other data. Uh, I should have actually put a slide in for ours, but you guys are writing up your paper right now, so you guys can tell me about that, about how, how our folks feel about marine protected areas. In this case, the question is, um, on, the, on the left, how about creating more marine reserves? As this, was, this was done um, in the uh, early 2000s. How about creating more marine reserves off the California coast, even if this means some coastal areas will be off limits to commercial and recreational fishing? You favor or oppose such an action? And the lion share of folks, the vast majority, said, yes, sure. Now, as we already talked about, we have fewer and fewer fisher, we have fewer and fewer people that fish in general. So most people are like, yeah, whatever, that's cool. I don't fit, whatever, it sounds good to me, right? So that, that, that's part of it. Um, but, but nevertheless, there's still a large number of folks that, that seem uh, to think this is a, a decent idea. On the right, the question says, do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea to create, a new marine, to, create a, to create new marine protected areas in about 10 to 20 percent of the ocean along uh, uh, of the ocean waters along California's coast? And so a similar number says yes, right? So whatever, up to a fifth of the area you can't fish in? Sure, fine, right? So the public seems to have uh, broad support. The question becomes, uh, how do we go about doing that? How do we define an MPA? So as we said, as we started talking about last time, a whole diversity of terms have been used in the past. What's, what's come into practice in the last 15 years is the term MPA, marine protected area, is generally the, the settled upon term now. Even though in the literature or historical stuff or in certain geographic areas, people might still use words like sanctuary. Right? We have our National Marine, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, we can talk about marine reserves, uh, those kinds of things. But, but all of this would fall under one, uh, all of them would be one type of marine protected area. Globally, this is what we're looking at. Looking at. So uh, the, the uh, light blue color or the, the, this color blue here are areas that... Um, a working group from WWF has proposed that are you know, really important areas we should work on. Not surprising, they're basically coastal areas, uh, mostly shelf areas. Um, and then uh, where do we have marine protected areas? And we have this dark, the dark blue signify that. So that looks pretty good. It looks like, hey, we're doing a, a good job. Um, and then we have stuff in the US. Um, the question, though, is um, what does that mean? Right? So when we see a map like this and somebody says, hey, you know, are the, is that protected? Ah, oh, it's great. So it look like looks like we're doing a good job, right? Uh, the, the level of protection varies dramatically. Not just here in Cal... Uh, but before uh, the activities we'll talk about in a little bit in California, not only did they vary a lot in California, they vary a lot all over the place. Um, Here's a breakdown. This is from a couple years ago now, but it it's still serves to make the, the point, which is um, this is this is globally now. All these areas and generally, I would say what a lot of our colleagues in the sciences would consider a marine protected air, 
on a marine protected area would be a so-called no-take zone, meaning you can't take anything. Uh, maybe a researcher could go in and, and sample some crabs and look for something, but, but no exploitation for, uh, you know, no recreational fishing, no commercial fishing, whatever. Um, and so, so the term for that is no take. So we see over here, uh, zone with no take areas. Uh, so, sorry, so this, this is the number of areas that are, that are totally no take. Um, this is area where nobody, nobody, not even scientists can go into. So that's, that's very few of those. Um, this guy is uniform multi, <clears throat> multiple use. So the vast majority are multiple use. So what does that mean? That means, who knows what it means. It means, yeah, it means some people could fish there. It means some people could, I don't know, extract sand there. It means some people could harvest kelp there. It means, it means whatever. So the vast majority of these areas on this map are not uniformly protected in, this, in the sense of banning everyone from doing it, just about anything that would be impactful. This is our view, and I talk about this in conservation biology, but, but um, it's important to touch on this here. This is our view of parks. This is our American view of parks. This is not how most of the world sees parks. So those of you guys who went up to Yosemite with the parks class, uh, whatever, two weeks ago or whatever it was, right? This is, this is the model that they're pushing, right? Oh my God, this is so great. Oh, by the way, don't take any pictures, Aspen, right? Don't take any pictures, because we don't want you to take a picture of this. Because we're trying to control the interpretation of the story, right? And, and, and the Park Service has a lot of great things. They have a very clear idea of, as to what their mandate is, what their mission is. And it basically means you apart from a park. Now, they won't say that. They, they want you to have access to parks. But you don't have free reign, right? It's very much there's the resource, and then there's you. And you might go to visit the resource, but parks like the Santa Monica Mountains here very different from most from our American conception of parks. There could well be historical stuff in here. There could be well be, I don't know, John Muir's cabin or something. But that's preserved as a historical thing, almost like a holy site, right? You can't screw with it, you, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's not how most of the world sees parks. Most of the world sees parks with humans integrated uh, uh, in, into the unit itself. Our idea of parks grew up in the American West. Our idea of parks grew up in areas that had relatively few, low human populations. And then that idea was expanded elsewhere, elsewhere to the US, elsewhere across the globe. And so, so it's, a, it's really important to make sure you guys have that uh, understanding. This is the world in which we really live. And marine protected areas or marine parks, if you will, um, have to contend with all this kind of stuff, right? Massive fishing, all kinds of pollution, um, right? We've talked about microplastics, Dorothy has her experiment going in the back, uh, all, that, all that kind of stuff. A, a much more complicated landscape than uh, greeted the first folks that were trying to figure out how to create terrestrial parks, national parks, and how to uh, you know, manage them, et cetera. Again, generally the idea that um, an unprotected area is going to be impacted, could be impacted by a lot of stuff, but in the context of how it's most popularly, de popularly described, it is extraction of biological resources. So on the left, for example, that would be an unprotected area, which of course has fish, but generally lower diversity or lower biomass, um, et cetera, of fish as compared to an area that is protected from um, fishing pressure. And so some people describe this process as trying to create a, a, a national park, but just in the ocean. Uh, I would say that's maybe not the right model, but, but that's how it, this has traditionally been uh, celebrated and uh, put forth. 
So again, this is this, so this catches us up to where we were uh, with our last discussion. So as I said before, a couple of you guys weren't here, so I'll just recap it pretty quickly. I think this is my only, yeah. Okay, so uh, we passed this law in 1999, and this law says that we have to overhaul our exist. So, so what we had before, this is this is on the left. This is our, this is a map of the that section of California with new areas created. So, so this isn't exactly right, but but you get the sense from this. There's a lot of there's a lot of units sprinkled around, right? Um, and back in the day, there was over 30 different categories of protected area. So the idea of this law was to overhaul that. Why is Yosemite where Yosemite is? Right, because there's, 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 there's some unique aspects about it. And it's, in the case of Yosemite, it's very um, striking visually, right? And so people, oh, this is beautiful, right? We should, we should have this place saved. Okay, cool. The other reason it was, it was set aside is because there was not a city in the middle of Yosemite. If there was a city in the middle of Yosemite, who cares how pretty it was? We wouldn't have saved it. If there was a city in the middle of Yellowstone, we wouldn't have saved Yellowstone, right? So there's a reason why national parks were birthed in the western U.S. as opposed to the eastern U.S., let's say, where we, have, where we had our large population base. So that means that sometimes we establish a park, say, where a park, quote unquote, should be. And other times we establish a park because we can. It's cheap land. It's available. There's no one there. There's, it's, not a, it's not by chance that we have a huge number of mountains in our national park. And then we have, proportionally speaking, not that many valleys or not that many coastal zones, because that's where people like to you know, occupy. So the idea here was not just, not just add to the network, but to truly overhaul the network. So if we find that this place was picked where Michaela is sitting, just because it was some dude's house or some whatever, and we do an analysis and we find out that no, she's not sitting in a cool place for whatever our, whatever our criteria is, we would, under this act, we would, we would get rid of of that area and maybe, I don't know, move it to Sean's seat kind of thing, right? So we're going to overhaul the network. The goal of which, in terms of, in terms of this overhaul, is to protect the ecosystem and to make sure that we have representation of all the different types of ecological communities that we're worried about. So sandy bottom, rocky bottom, kelp forest, all this and that, okay? And, uh, and again, and so, yeah, so the idea is we're gonna, we're gonna reform all these things. Um, just to make sure, you guys have probably heard all these terms before in Khan's bio or whatever, but just to make sure. So postage stamp res reserves refers to little teeny tiny things, right? They're, that, you know, by analogy are the size of a postage stamp, meaning very small. So, so that, you know, yes, it would count in some inventorying of the government that we have one of these units, but in an ecological sense, probably minimally impactful, right? Paper parks, again, is this notion that the park only exists on paper. Does, the laws are not enforced, it, it's, it's, or everybody ignores them, or whatever the case may be. It, it's a park in paper only. The park exists on some legal document somewhere, or on some website somewhere, and that's, in effect, all. And then, of course, this other thing, as I mentioned last time, the confusing nature of these more than 30 categories, where on one site you could not collect snails, on, but you could fish. On another site, you, you, you couldn't collect fish, but you could take invertebrates. On others, you could take them during some of the year and not the other. It, so once we get complicated like that, it gets very hard for me to understand, for you to understand, for Joe Blow to understand. And so it becomes easy for folks to violate. And then the folks that are enforcing it are like, well, yeah, I kind of see how you would think that, right? So, then, so all that leads to non-strict enforcement. And so the idea here is let's simplify everything. OK, here are the specific goals of that 1999 act for the state of California. We, we want to pr uh, protect diversity and function, which is key. OK, 
Okay, this is, this is definitely reflects our new thinking. Not just the number of critters, not just the types of critters, but the processes that are happening within this ecosystem. We need to protect those processes. So if some of the processes are recruitment, if some of the processes are uh, filtering pollutants, uh, whatever, protecting the coast from storm uh, damage, whatever, those processes need to be protected as well. Uh, we want to not let our biological populations, our ecological populations, decline any further. So we want to make sure they stay, they're stable. But then in most cases, we want to restore them because their numbers, as we've already mentioned, and as you've been reading, their numbers are depressed. So we want to you know, help them get back to a more, um, what we think is, is a more uh, unimpacted or, or, or less impacted level. Want to improve recreational, <laughs> so this is, yeah. So this is, this is, this is one of the things. Uh, do all this and then also improve recreation and education and study opportunities, right? So, so this is one of those grab bag things where yes, of course, do we want, not want to promote education? Pfft, totally want to promote education. Do we not want to have people recreate? No, 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 we want people to recreate. But each of these additional things, which are, which are worthy goals in and of themselves, dramatically complicate the matter, right? If the goal of this act was to just provide recreational opportunities, that's relatively easy. It's really, it really be straightforward. If it was just to provide educational opportunities, that would be straightforward. If it was just to protect natural diversity, that would be straightforward. But having all these things together is a challenge in any context. Add that into the coastal zone, and as, you got, as we've been learning this semester, it gets even that much more complex. Um, Right, uh, so again, this notion of representative things, make sure we have all the different stuff uh, covered. Um, uh, things that are particularly unique, a classic example would be a spawning area. So we might say, oh, this fish exists all over this whole part of the coast, right? Whole part of the coast, and whatever, I don't know, from, from Point Conception down to San Diego, right? So all this, whatever, uh, I don't know, kelp forest habitat is their habitat. So you might say, oh, well, we're preserving whatever percentage of the kelp forest habitat, so that's cool, that'll help this thing, this fish. Yes, probably, but there could, other, there could also be other aspects. So for example, there could be pinnacles. So geological features, which tend to attract, you'll see this a lot with wrasses, uh, ceranids, and things like that, where um, there, there are, are features that they'll come to um, and they'll reproduce around. So for example, the females will go up, and release eggs and the males will swim in right behind and release sperm and so that particular pinnacle it might only be the size of this room or this building really really important so disproportionately important so almost to the point of and if there's only a few of those that would be a unique aspect of this of this um, organism's habitat that's something we particularly want to focus on and if there are things like that we want to make sure that not only do we have one or two of those but those unique things, we do make sure they have some level of protection as well. The next series of, of uh, goals reflect our, our learning, our growth in terms of management over the previous couple decades, in terms of what does not work, what contributes to failure. The first of which is a clear objective. You must be very clear as to what we're trying to achieve. If you do not have a well-articulated goal stated succinctly, you could have a longer explanation justification later, but if you, can't, if you can't do that succinctly, right? You guys are doing your reading summaries, you're boiling down these papers into a paragraph or two, right? And it's a pain in the butt, I understand. And it's hard sometimes, I understand. But that skill is absolutely key. If you can't do that, that means you can't go to the PTA group, you can't go to the fisherman group, you can't go to the TV reporter. You can't go to, so reporters are great, but I've, I've yet, uh, well maybe, I've had maybe, maybe, maybe three or four reporters interview me over all the years that I felt really totally understood the subject, right? Most reporters are not experts in the field and not that they necessarily have to be. So they always say, yeah, explain it to me. Yeah, okay, so really simply, right? 
give this to me in a, a sentence or give this to me in three or four sentences, right? And so, uh, so we need to be able to, our, if we can't make our objectives clear, we shouldn't be doing this. So, the, so we want to have clear objectives. Next, effective management. Everybody would like that. Um, uh, and then another key one is adequate enforcement. If we're not going to enforce this, why the heck are we doing this? So hopefully some of you guys will take our next introduction to drones or inter, you know, remotely piloted systems next semester. Uh, those of you that took it, let's see, nobody here took it last spring. Um, a, a person I had helping us uh, with it and now is going to be uh, partly teaching it with me this coming um, semester uh, is one of our alumni who's also a game warden for the state. He works in Ventura County. For all Ventura County, we have three game wardens for all of Ventura County, for all the water, for all the mountains, for all the ag areas, whatever. We don't, we, we, we've, we're, we're very, and, and California is a well, is a wealthy state, right? California is, even though we always have these budget issues, we're well financed, right? We're well supported. You can imagine what it's like in other areas of our country, other areas of the world. So if we can't reasonably expect some realistic enforcement, we shouldn't try to go down this road because that just creates paper parks one, two, and that just makes everybody say, this is all baloney. And I think, and I think justifiably so, right? If you're gonna create all these rules and then say, if you do this, you'll go to jail, or if you do this, you'll get a fine, and then people do it and they don't go to jail, or they don't get a fine, what's the, why do we have that rule, right? So if we're, if we're not gonna be able to enforce this, let's not go down this road. Sound science, of course, right? Everyone's sound science, supposedly. Um, and then, and then lastly, and this is key here, these things should not be created as one-off entities, right? These things should be designated and evaluated and changed in the future or adapted as a single entity, as a network. We're not gonna consider, you know, reserve number 24 just as reserve number 24, we're gonna consider how reserve 24 plays into the overall population of these fish, which might either move up and down the coast or their propagules might disperse up and down the coast. So we're gonna look at it holistically as a network. So what'd you catch? Hit the mother load today. You've got to be kidding. Do I even need the gauge? I haven't seen fish this big in years. Okay, it's not this bad, but fishing today simply isn't what it used to be. Almost one third of US fish stocks are overexploited, threatening the future of sport and family fishermen. Yet at the same time, our government is proposing to weaken necessary protections. This shouldn't happen. Please call your local member of Congress. Okay, so that was a little bit of a funny thing. That was from a few years ago, but it um, serves to make the point. So we want to make this stuff simpler so we preserve these resources um, more effectively. Um, okay, so he here's our categories of marine protected areas now. Um, <laughs> Gazuntai, we've dealt, we've finished almost all of this process. We still have the San Francisco Bay Area to go, but everything else is basically done. Um, so we have a st state marine reserve, and this is the, the strictest type of designation where um, you might not be able to take a boat in. You, you definitely can't fish in there, uh, et cetera. Then we have State Marine Park. Park bans commercial fishing. Then we have State Marine Conservation Area. And this will allow some activities, some, some uh, extraction. So for example, it might allow kelp uh, canopy extraction, um, et cetera. 
and then we have some state marine recreational management areas. There's not many, not many of these, but there's a few. So top of the list, most restrictive, down the list, uh, less and less restrictive. Should also say all of this is about fishing and access. In, the st in state waters, we do not allow any additional oil and gas drilling as of now. The state is not interested in supporting that. We have existing leases. There are leases in federal waters, which are also, there's also a moratorium on, on new leases in there. Um, but what you often hear is people say, oh, no, no, this is not just about fishing. This is about you know, other things, too. But in effect, in California, the only thing that is left is really fishing and potentially sand extraction in some areas in terms of the resource extraction. How far along are they on the like, San Francisco Bay? Like, Not sure. Not sure. Um, yeah, good question. I don't know. Um, so these are the regions that the Marine Life Protection Act uh, broke, broke the state up into. So these generally make logical sense. So these are areas that have similar, similar geographies, similar, uh, similar populations, similar patterns of, of exploitation, etc. cetera. Uh, as of now, these, these slides are a little bit old, but as of now, we've, we've um, both gone through the process, which is a several year endeavor, uh, and then come to a final agreement and then actually enacted and put into place these MPAs in areas four, two, one, and three. So five is the only one that we're, we're still uh, in the process of uh, going through. Um, the most recent one was, was our area, the South Coast area, which was basically left to last with the exception of San Francisco because we are so complicated. Because of the, the problems we mentioned last time that, that the designation of marine protected areas the Marine Protected Area Network and the Channel Islands caused by the, by, by the lack of engagement with stakeholders and the, and the foolish, unfortunate behavior of some of the um, scientists that just sort of told the public, we're smart, we know how to do this, we, you know, we don't need to hear from you. Um, and, the, and the bad blood that created that we discussed last time. Um, uh, one, and then two, just because we have the largest population base in the coast. In, in the uh, in, in the coastal zone, uh, that's us. Also, we have the largest recreational fisher, fishing uh, efforts, and so as problematic as as some people might view commercial exploitation, commercial exploitation is is sort of is similar, right? Recreational fishing is quite diverse, uh, much more diffuse throughout the population, so uh, harder perhaps to get a a bead on on sentiment and. And the commercial fishing industry, you could go to different representatives pretty easy. It's a little bit harder with recreational folks. So those are the regions. Um, uh, this is an old timeline, right? And this, I need to update this. But um, as, we, as we mentioned, the, the act passes in 1999. It starts and stalls because of the essentially, the, the essential bad goings on primarily stimulated by the efforts in the Channel Islands. Um, we finally get to an agreement. We have a new governor who is Governor Schwarzenegger who is interested in this and wants to have an environmental, is very interested in environment issues. So pushes forward uh, uh, starting in uh, the about four years after the act passes and then really gets going um, about six years after the act originally passes, wasted a lot of money. This also got going because of an infusion of money from some NGOs that agreed to help the process along and, and do some key stuff. So the Central Coast started, which was the first section in 2005, followed by the North. So started here, went to here, then to here, then to here, and now we're on five. Um, and so uh, the San Francisco Bay process, I think, is wrapping up, but I have not paid much attention uh, to that. Um, right, there we go. 
<clears throat> so this is how uh, it ended up working. So we had uh, experts. We had a scientific advisory team. It's over here. That's providing the technical details. How, what, uh, how much of the bottom of the ocean is sand versus kelp, etc. Uh, what were our number of fish landed in 1950 versus 2000, that kind of stuff. Science advisory team, now this, so there's, there's an overall team, but, but these are created for each, each uh, section, right? So for each region has a science advisory team. We have stakeholder groups, again, for each, this is done by region. So for each area, we have stakeholder groups. And this is all the st stakeholder groups you can think of. So there'll be a group representing the recreational fishing community, a group representing the aquaculture uh, uh, groups, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Recreational folks, uh, you know, scuba industry, tourism, all that stuff. All these guys are in groups, and it's an iterative process. You guys provided, in, well, my, some of my previous students provided input. So anybody, so not only is it that, it's also as the process evolved and we got better over the decade, we, we created better tools and were able to um, better engage larger swaths of people. So the stakeholders originally were traditional stakeholder groups that would come to a, a, a conference room at a hotel somewhere and meet for a couple days and give input, right, and eat and drink coffee and eat cookies and talk about stuff. By the end, those existed as well as an opportunity for folks that couldn't go to those in the general public to provide input. And we'll talk about that. Um, talk about that. I'm not sure what I'll talk about that, but in a little bit I'll talk about that. Um, one of the key tools that we developed, which is now being used around the world, is called C-Sketch, um, which is sort of a Google Earth-like tool to provide uh, the public an opportunity to say where they think um, areas should be. And that tool has gotten more sophisticated over time, created by some of our friends up at UCSB. Okay, so then, uh, so, so all these guys will come together there, and there's going to be different alternatives. So pretty soon there will be a coalescing around, uh, okay, we could do option A or option B or option C. And with everything, there are upsides and downsides. So the question becomes how good, how good and to how many people and to how many communities are the upsides and then, you know, vice versa. And so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the, these guys make the recommendations. The so-called Blue Ribbon Task Force, the sort of head folks, um, which, which, which the Blue Ribbon Task Force is for the whole state now. Now there's, there's not one Blue Ribbon Task Force for each unit, each, each subsection. No, just because we want, these guys are working on this all the time. So there, there's scientists on there, there's representative of the fishing industry, et cetera. Um, and so they're, they're the folks that are going to technically evaluate. So, so each, each area is going to put forward a couple different alternatives. And then they're going to say, here's, here's a bunch of alternatives, but here's the preferred one. So this is the one we think we should go with. Again, those alternatives will have morphed and changed over time because it was an iterative process. So folks were giving, you know, well, we really, really, really. Okay, so, okay, we can agree with all of... All of uh, alternative four, but we really, really, really want to have this one protected area that's not in area four in, right? So then maybe we'd modify area four. So eventually they're going to get to one preferred alternative. The Blue Ribbon Task Force looks at it. They again make their, say, that, yeah, this is, this is the one that we think is the best one. And they send it up. And then technically the California Fish and Game Commission which many of you guys have never heard of. Well, right. Um, yeah, I know the, the name has changed since the act was created. So first it's called Fish, yeah, right. So we used to call it California Fish and Game. The governor decided that game is an inappropriate terminology and implies that we're only here to protect things that we harvest. So it, it should be about uh, wildlife, not just game. 
my understanding is that uh, they haven't started printing new, they haven't done a new website per se. They haven't changed all the logos on all the vehicles. And the scuttlebutt inside the agency, the people that I talk to say that they're just waiting for a new governor to come in and they'll change the name back. Um, you might say, what's in a name? It's not that big a deal. But it actually is, it causes a good deal of confusion because we have the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which almost everybody just calls Fish and Wildlife. So now, and people would traditionally just call it Fish and Game. So now that we have Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife, it, it just is confusing. It, it's just straight up confusing. And so, so while normally I would agree with the sentiment that we shouldn't call it Fish and Game, it, it's, you know, it's been going on for over 100 years and whatever. In any event, um, the commission, which is uh, the body that passes every year, every year votes on the code, the fishing game code, the fish and wildlife now code, that says what exactly are the rules for this year or, or the new rules we're adding in this year. Those are the those that's the entity that formally decides all everybody up until that point, everybody up until this top thing. It's all just a recommendation, technically speaking. And so when those folks vote, those folks are that's the creation of the of the thing. They're, they're the they're the formal deciders, even though they basically just went with the blue ribbon task forces recommendations. So, again, we have different stakeholder groups. They represent all kinds of folks. And uh, this is a story. Uh, I'll read it for you. It says, what we learned from working together is that all the stakeholders, so we have a conservationist on the left and we have a fisherman on the right. What we learned from working together is that all the stakeholders had one thing in common. We all care deeply about the health of the ocean. We want this effort to serve as our gift to the future, one small bright spot amid so many troubling legacies. I would have to say that when I've worked on these panels for this and similar type things, I, have a, I always have a great time. They're really, really good. Um, folks that uh, might seem to be at odds with one another uh, a lot of times people can put those differences aside and and really respect each other and and generally they work the panels that i've been on and the, and the committees and things that i've been on um and advisory groups that i've been on have been great and they they really reaffirm my faith in the fact that we can better manage these resources and come together and uh, now maybe it's a maybe it's a factor of only people that are the kind of people that are willing to talk to one another and won't spit at each other are the kind of folks selected for this. But nevertheless, um, I find these things uh, actually very heartening and very empowering. It's important to say that, again, not everything is perfect in, by any way, shape or form. Um, so uh, one of the groups that has traditionally been ignored in California in these types of processes are the, our First Nation peoples and, and their feelings and their efforts. This has mostly been an issue up in Northern California, Central and Northern California, where uh, with, with, and especially with regards to Salmonid runs. And, and so some of these folks um, that have had traditional access to taking fish uh, have felt, and I think with a lot of good justification, that they've been, they were at least initially quite excluded from the process. And this was the scientists, and this was the modern fisher, fisher people, not the, not the uh, traditional folks. Um, and we had a similar experience in Santa Barbara, some of the meetings I went to with some of the Chumash tribes. Okay, so the, the big... Uh, issues here in terms of what we're trying to do is uh, is this. So first we want to make the the area big enough. What is big enough? Don't know. We're figuring this out, right? We don't we're kind of figuring we're figuring this up as we go. But the idea would be that it would be big enough to have an ecological effect. We'd want it to be um, deep enough so that we can span a range of near shore communities. So wait, all, yeah. I guess I just assume then the impedes just went down to the bottom. They don't go away. Uh, I don't know of any MPAs that were designated in three dimensions. All the MPAs that I know of are designated in two dimensions. So it's a map on the surface of the water. Wow. So the assumption usually is that they go down 
but it, it uh, um, and of course people would say that you're not talking about the top inch of the ocean, but I would just say that there's, um, this is particularly the case, for example, in California with those rockfish we mentioned a little bit ago, which are, which are very deep dwelling. And so we don't want to just focus on the shallows. We want to focus on some of the areas offshore that, that encompass some of the, the deeper regions. And then um, another really, really key factor that we, we just don't, we're still learning a lot about. We just don't know that much. But, but is that um, close enough together for these guys to, to do their due? So, you know, there's this guideline that says within 50 to 100 kilometers of each other, who, I mean, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I mean, especially back in 99, not very, there's a lot of theoretical stuff. Those guys I mentioned when we were doing the planning for uh, Channel Islands, a lot of great theory, a lot of great theory, but um, still mostly theory. If we were trying to create a marine protected area to save, uh, what, I don't know, horn sharks. This would be an easy thing to figure out. How big is big enough? How deep is deep enough? How close is close enough? But when we're talking about these communities of diverse critters that have wide, potentially widely varying needs, that gets, that gets way more complicated, right? Okay, then we had again this issue of feasibility. So we want to make it something that is easier to deal with, right? Uh, the, the reserve that I worked in as an undergrad that did my PhD in, which is out of Catalina, Island, off of Catalina Island, is one, which is crazy, which is one of the oldest protected areas created in the late 60s. Um, insane. Really good, really good fish. The reason, so the, it looks like this, that where, where the land is, where this particular reserve was. It only goes out a few hundred meters off the shore. And then goes like that. So it hugs the shore. It includes this large bay called Big Fisherman's Cove. But the reason it was so effective is, is partly because it was so small, right? A few, yeah, a few square kilometers. Easy to find, but more importantly, how it was laid out, what I you have, can't tell from this image, but this is a big giant cliff. And the marine lab is up here. So at the start of lobster season, say, each year, the, one of the people from the lab, the diving safety officer, the director, or for that matter, the head of the Harbor Patrol, who was married to one the secretary uh, that worked in the office, um, they could walk on up to this bluff and look and see everything. And so with not needing a boat and anything, they could just walk right up and they could see if someone was violating the, the area. So having easily defined boundaries is actually key. And so that's what this is trying to, that's what this example of this guideline is trying to show is that it should be really obvious. Come off of something that's easy to see, such as a point, and go to, say, another point or a water tank or you know, something that is very, very obvious, don't need anything high tech, very clear. Of course, even with that, even with that, we'd ha I'd have issues where uh, they tell you guys about my, I don't think I told you guys the story yet. So um, I was doing this experiment, which required putting out these um, uh, terracotta tiles that were fixed to concrete blocks that had cages on top of them that then had these wing things on top of them because I was, I was young and, and impetuous and thought that the, the experimental design should be the most important thing. Uh, you know, feasibility was another issue for me. So I, I had all these things and um, I was looking at how, how al algae and other critters um, uh, recruit on these tiles. And so I put, this, put these tiles in this marine reserve because I knew people, were, in, this, in this case, that particular reserve, there were, no anchoring was allowed. So people could not drop an anchor, which would obviously break all the delicate pieces of stuff. 
also for my experiment, it had to go for several months because I was looking for how these things accrued over time. So I remember one of my uh, darkest days <laughs> in graduate school was I thought, you know, all this work is getting ready to have this great big experiment and, you know, get near the end. And I, I go out to check on my sites, which was during one of the last big holidays in the summer. So all the yahoos, all the yachty yahoos come out. And I'm driving up and I see this guy in a cigarette boat <laughs> driving way too fast, creating wakes. I'm not supposed to have wakes in this, this area. <laughs> uh, big giant dude, must have been like 300, 350 pounds. At first I thought he had a shirt on, he just was very hairy. <laughs> Gold chains, big giant two-tone sunglasses on, drinking a beer. <laughs> and I'm in a boat called, the name of the boat was called the Loper. So it went very, very slow. It was the former garbage scow for the island. So it was a great working boat, but it went very slowly. So we're a putt, 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 putt. And I see in front of me, <laughs> this dude pull up right, right over my sight. Now, as I've said, that area was well designated. I mean, it was, it, was, it was clear going from point to point. And hanging off the cliff were, was, were giant signs on plywood that said, Marine Reserve, no anchoring. Right? So if you're too stupid to read a map, if you just opened your eyes and looked right in front of you, you would see a big giant sign that said, hey, no, don't. Um, so you are, allowed, you're, you are still allowed to kayak in. You can swim in. You can scuba in. You just can't. You just can't, uh, you know, anchor a boat or fish or stuff like that. So I drive up, and just as I'm pulling up, I see this guy go to the bow of his boat, pull this giant anchor with a massive amount of chain, and just chuck his anchor in the middle of this kelp forest. And then he must have had about eight little kids, and they all go, yee! And they all jump off the boat and start immediately start snorkeling, going in all different directions from the boat. And I'm... I'm getting like a heart attack. I'm going, ah, and I'm screaming, and it's loud. And I'm far away. The guy can't hear me. And I'm like, ah, 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 and, and pull up and, and get there. And, uh, and I, was, I was angry. And uh, I, try, I, try, I like to pride myself on saying that when I interact with the public, I generally speak well. <laughs> I was very angry, so I started using very bad language with this gentleman and started get, cursing at him and saying he's a blankety blank. And this guy was clearly at least slightly inebriated. And I said, what the uh, bleepity bleep do you think you're doing? And the guy said, what? You know, what are you talking about? I said, you can't be here. He said, I'm American. I said, no, 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 you can't be here. You can't anchor here. And he said, I remember distinctly, he said, uh, you can't tell me I can't anchor here. And I said, Yes, you can't anchor here. I can tell you that. You're not supposed to anchor here. He said, well, it's not on the map. And I said, yes, it is. And by the way, it's on that cliff. <laughs> and I remember the guy looking and just sort of staring at the big sign for a little bit. And then because I was so angry and I was yelling, he said, oh, there's kids around here. You know, don't use that language. And I said, <laughs> another bad word to the guy. And I said, you know, I don't care. You've just destroyed like six months worth of work. You know, da 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 da. And he goes, fine, fine, I'll just go pull up my anchor. I said, yeah, you'll pull up your anchor, but wait, I'm going to free dive down and pull it up, and then you can pull it up. And so I pulled it, and of course, he destroyed a bunch of my um, things. And I just remember sitting in the boat being like, Jesus, even when we have clearly designated areas, even when we have additional signage, there's still going to be the silly people out there that just do what they're going to do. And so, um, so while none of these designs that we're looking at right here will, are perfect, the more we can simplify these things, the better. And the least likely we'll have those guys happening. A huge fault, a huge failing in my opinion, of our current Marine Life Protection Act is we've gone through all this work, we have all these things, you cannot in one click go to a website and download on a on a Google Earth or on your phone all of these areas. I, it, it is beyond stupid while that while you can't do that. So if you're just Joe Blow Fisher person that wants to know, maybe you want to follow the right guidelines. You know, they'll put all these really wonderful bro glossy brochures out and you can go get them and this and that. But 
how most people are interacting with stuff, as you guys know, it's with their mobile device. We do not have a mobile device friendly that's, that's easy to get, that's can you just port it out. And that, that's a measure, in my opinion, of most of these folks being old. Most of the staff that works in these issues are old folks. They're stuck in these government bureaucracies. They're not adapting to the new technologies. But anyway, okay. So here, for example, is, is uh, the, one of the first ones we had designated the Central Coast. And what you see is, what you'll see when you go to the website, you, we can, you can look at these maps. Um, and may, may, maybe, maybe that's a good task. Maybe I should have you guys go see if you can find a, a, a KML of these, of these uh, see how many clicks it takes you to find the KML of these things. But in any event, here we go. So here's uh, Point Conception down here. And uh, you see we have the um, State Marine Reserve. Uh, and okay, sorry. So I should also let me orient you. So the uh, light blue is state waters. Okay, so obviously the this is a state law. This only pertains to uh, state waters. They do not continue out into federal waters. Although in places like here, what we're talking about is this is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So this area outside in federal waters is a marine sanctuary, and does have. Uh, additional fishing constraints as opposed to just some random area of the of federal water the waters so that's why we have this bounding area okay so anyway so okay we have the strongest uh, designation the next strongest designation is in yellow and then uh, we have the uh, state marine conservation areas are in this uh, darker uh, colored blue so here you can see some of these things are around points. Some of these things are uh, by themselves. Some of them things, some of these things have a nested nature to them. So they have a part that has an additional degree of, of constraint in terms of what's allowed. And then other areas, which is, which is more permissive. They are not clumped into one area. They are uh, uh, sprinkled around the coast. All right, so here's, uh, for example, here's what some of these guys look like. And, so, this, so this is Point Lobos, and then this is what the area uh, looks like. So, um, so even, e even with this whole designation here, most of these tend to be on the smaller side. So uh, the Carmel's site is uh, about one and not quite one and a half square kilometers, uh, five square kilometers. If, if we look at the average size of protected areas, marine protected areas across the globe, uh, so it's, it's hard to know because the data is always changing. But, but most recently when we did this, it's something like about four square kilometers is the average size. We do have these. Uh, some of these ones that people talk about, these large gigantor things like the Great Barrier Reef, like the Phoenix Island uh, reserves out in the Pacific. But the majority of marine protected areas across the world are small uh, in, in size. Cool. So this is some of the information that goes in, that w went into the designation. First, it was the topography, the benthic shape. And that, 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 that sonar data was then translated into habitat. And that's what you're seeing represented here. So what proportion of this area is rock versus, uh, say, kelp versus sand? And with these tools, with these tools, we could then, we, we then uh, overlaid um, fishing uh, effort and, and fishing take. So all this stuff goes together into this, right? So uh, generally, there's been a ten there was a tension, there is a tension within these, in these efforts between conservation folks who want to maximize the conservation value and people interested in extraction that want to maximize the extraction of the resource. So, for example, if we found that um, that here's where a whole bunch of recreational fishing happens and you were worried about recreational fishing, maybe you'd come in and you'd draw your box right there. Right. 
So that might benefit the, the conservationists. That would obviously clearly hurt the extraction folks. So this is a give and take. So generally, the approach that was tried to, the path that was tried to follow, tried to follow, was, yeah, let's, maybe we take away some of the intense fishing areas, but certainly not all of them, right? The fishermen still need to make a living. They still need to harvest these guys. And if the whole point was to simply stop fishing, that's a different exercise. This was not to kill fishing, despite what some people said. This was to um, make sure that we have sustainable level of fish stocks to be able to keep fishing through time. Uh, and so just here's an example of some of the alternatives in, in the area around the Central Coast or that we traditionally go to and look at in this trip. Um, and so you'll see that, uh, so here's option, here's option one, option two, option three. Um, what we'll see is you'll th see things like, check it out, this little area here, this little red area is here, and it's here, and it's here. So some things, in that case, that is the hop, that's uh, a traditional res reserve that has been in effect for a long time, even before we had a legal definition of what a marine reserve would be, because that was off the coast of the marine lab, Stanford's marine lab, Hopkins marine lab. So in effect, people have been monitoring, it's very, very small, but people have been monitoring that, following that for a long time. So nobody's gonna propose to start fishing there because nobody's gonna be allowed to fish in there. So, th so some of these alternatives build upon some things like that, even though we said we're gonna completely restart from zero, some things it was clear we were never gonna allow fishing in, in some areas. Um, a lot of media followed this, a lot of people, a lot of social media stuff uh, took, this, took this on. And again, the fishing community was, uh, felt assaulted by a lot of this. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of rhetoric was generated about putting fish, f fishing families out of work and this and that. Um, and so concomitantly, there's a large amount of education and there remains a large amount of education to inform people about these things uh, how we establish these things and how we will continue to do them every five years the law instructs that we have to reassess these things so these are not permanent in perpetuity designations if we find that one is not working or or some design element is not working we are to revise it. In practice, that would be very hard because this was a lot of money, state money and NGO money and a lot of time and effort, but we're still supposed to do that, right? And if we truly found something really egregious with this system, we should, we should revise it. 